Good morning and uh, welcome to this session on building community. Um, I've got a number of guests to introduce, but perhaps I should just explain who on earth I am first. So my name is Matthew Taylor, Lord Taylor. I have been involved with planning uh, reforms with Labour, Coalition and Conservative governments, uh, going back to something called Living Working Countryside that introduced ideas of neighbourhood planning and the MPPF. Uh, created the online planning guidance uh, and then uh, the, the thinking behind the, the Garden Towns and Villages program. I continue to work on primarily building new communities, some uh, urban regeneration, some edge of settlement uh, and, and particularly uh, wholly new communities under the Garden Towns and Village program. So my obsession in that is how do you create community, how do you create functioning places uh, that are thriving, as it said on my old uh, rural review, are living working places um, that people enjoy living in and provide economic, social and environmental sustainability. Um, therefore, I'm particularly pleased to uh, be hosting this panel today because it goes to the heart of many of those concerns. Uh, and we've got an interesting and expert panel to introduce to you, uh, Helen Evans, who is chair of Network Housing Group, uh, one of the leading housing associations, developing housing association. Uh, I was chair of the National Housing Federation in the past, so it's good to see a, a debate around the importance of housing associations, who I see as critical partners in much placemaking that goes on uh, around the country. Uh, we're hoping uh, to be joined by Ben Husham, the Mayor of Tees Valley, but as is the uh, one of these online debates, somebody's uh, computer system fails at the critical moment and he's having difficulty getting online, but we're hoping he'll be joining us. If he doesn't, uh, the face in front of you is uh, uh, Will Tanner. Uh, uh, welcome to you. He's director onward and will be... Uh, Sitting in in uh, Ben's place, so as long as Ben doesn't arrive. So thank you, Will, for coming in at the last minute. But also, of course, you've been invo heavily involved in the whole organisation uh, at this event. I'd then like to welcome Mike Amesbury, who's the Shadow Minister for Housing uh, and Planning. Uh, I understand he's sitting in Parliament at the moment. He assures me Boris isn't anywhere in sight. Uh, and unlike me, he hasn't got the risk of the postman arriving and the dog going mad. So, but, uh, but just about everybody else is mad in Parliament, and I can say that with some experience. Um, but Mike, thank you. You're, you're, you've got a really fundamental role uh, at the moment um, with many announcements being brought forward by government for big planning reforms. Uh, but the party itself, uh, the Labour Party, committed, of course, it, uh, also to... Uh, a lot of housing development and building community. So uh, very pleased to have you party to this. And then uh, finally, Helen Golden, Chief Executive of the Young Foundation, uh, a huge history of working not just with the Young Foundation, but with a series of roles in policy making and policy thinking. Uh, and really pleased to have you uh, join us as well for your insight. Um, that's enough from me. This isn't my role today, much as I want to speak at great length on these issues. So uh, I'll hold myself back and instead introduce um, well, Helen Evans. Can we start with you and talk about how uh, the role of housing association particularly? But, but your thoughts in general. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, housing associations are not a single homogenous group. We range from tiny little organisations managing a few, only managing a few arms houses to the behemoth of the Clarions and LNQs with hundreds of thousands of homes. But all housing associations share some fundamentals, and that is that the provision of a decent, secure, appropriately sized uh, home is the foundation from which people can live their best lives. And if we do that successfully, then we do much more than just provide uh, bricks and mortar has a place where he can do his or her homework uh, peacefully that's enhancing his educational opportunities. Old people who are enabled to live in homes in their communities avoid social isolation um, and you know can live fuller lives. If you do it successfully then there are many benefits 
for communities that development inherently uh, produces. However, many housing associations do much more than this. They involve themselves in the other activities that make successful communities. For example, they provide uh, assistance into employment, they provide activities for young people, um, and they do this out of a sort of both social purpose but also a sense of enlightened self-interest because obviously, you know, if you've got uh, people working, um, whether in uh, it enterprises or from home, they're able to pay their rent. That's an important part of our business model. So there's a social purpose element to it, but there's also, as I said, enlightened self-interest. The thing about housing associations is that we're in it for the long term. People use the expression patient capital, and that is one of our absolute strengths. Our business model is very secure. We're a good place for investors to put their money, which is critically important to us being able to continue to develop. And it means we can pay attention to the factors in a development of a community, of a place, that will only demonstrate its value over the very long term. And all housing associations who are engaged strongly in development are very preoccupied with what makes a community work. And we've all seen the successful and unsuccessful examples of how people have tried to address this. You know, we have battalions of buildings with empty shops at the ground floor level, which were put there as part of a sort of community place making effort, which didn't necessarily work. Um, but it's not the kind of thing that you can afford to give up on. And I think that where it does work, it unleashes the power of uh, effort and input from people rather than institutions. One of the things that I am interested in exploring from the, from the housing association perspective is what ought to be the limits of our role. I think that we have to kind of get into a mindset where we want to enable and empower rather than, rather than instruct and enforce. And sometimes it's quite a difficult thing to you know, mentally accept, because if you're faced with a proposition or a problem or a situation, the immediate impulse is to try and solve it, resolve it. And actually, in lots of the situations that we deal with, we can only do that if we work with others. Um, you know, I've used the example for, uh, of people who are in our homes who are experiencing serious mental health issues. The expectation of our customers is often that we deal with that somehow but very often the housing association doesn't have the expertise or indeed the powers to solve that kind of problem and can only do so if it works collaboratively with people who have the expertise and with the people who live in that community to come to an accommodation of a situation that suits everybody um, another example where the sort of limits of our you know rightful role is often debated is in low level criminality and antisocial behavior and so on. We are, you know, quite often when we're explaining to communities, we are not the police. We don't have these kind of statutory powers. People have expectations sometimes of landlords in their ability to control the behavior of the people who live in their homes, which is a, way beyond anything that is legally there and B, beyond anything that is in any way desirable in my view. Um, so we have to identify what is the appropriate developer, the landlord, and where we need to be working to sort of enable other people to do what is to make a successful community. And I think this debate has become particularly acute over recent years as the resources of other uh, parts of the public realm have reduced. You know, it's well known that local authorities have less have resources to deal with some issues, um, created a vacuum and the temptation has been to housing associations, including my own, to step into that vacuum and try and, you know, compensate for the lack of those resources. It's worked much better when we hadn't done that and we've tried to be, if you like, the enabler, the glue that sticks other agencies together and allows communities to resolve problems for themselves. In the recent pandemic, we've seen some great examples of how powerful this can be when it works really well. As we were engaged in getting our staff all working from home, calling up residents to make sure that they were all right. Having made that call, if somebody is you know, not all right, there's an obligation, if you like, to help do something about it. And 
they're able to do that by signposting them to the plethora of community groups and neighbourhood uh, committees and so on who were looking after people in those, those localities. It worked much better in that context than us trying to do it ourselves in a sort of institutional and bureaucratic way. And I feel that the role of housing associations in this sort of enabling of communities is something that we really need to focus on, explore, and make as effective as we can. So having said it's not all about bricks and mortar, I would just like to finish by saying it is also about bricks and mortar. Homes really matter. If people don't have an appropriate home, then they can't live their best life. And through the course of the pandemic, we've seen the reliance that we place on people who are often locked out of housing markets. The definition of what is a key worker has stretched from doctors and nurses and police officers to delivery people, to uh, shop workers, retail workers, and so on, the kind of people who keep our society functioning Many of those people are locked out of housing markets or have been historically, and housing associations have a mission and a duty to ensure that they can live in the communities that they serve. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. No, I'm, and I'm, <clears throat> I, there's many questions, and I, I, I'd like to come in on immediately, and I suspect others, but I want to keep the panel coming first so that you've all got a chance to comment. So, um, I, I will. I'm not going to bring you in where Ben would have done because he may join us yet. So uh, I'm afraid you're going to be on tenterhooks as to whether he, I, I, if, if you're there long enough, I might let you speak anyway. But um, <laughs> for the moment, just smile and wave um, because I, I think I'll go straight to Mike Amesbury. Uh, uh, Mike, where, where's, where, what's the perspective that, you, that, the, that the Labour Party's now got? On, on, it's, it's it's building communities, isn't it? How, how I think the, there's, there's one part of this is maintaining communities, but but also creating new communities is is a different challenge. Yes, yes. So, sorry, I lost you for a moment there, but um, look, it's it, it's great to be um, um, welcome to this uh, to this conference and and follow follow Helen. But let me start with answering the fundamental question and. And that's what makes a successful place. And, 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 you know, I would argue, I'm sure we all would argue, it would be people, people, people. If we look at the um, current um, COVID-19 national and international pandemic, um, our communities, our housing associations, councils and volunteers, um, uh, highlighted by Helen there, have, have been at the forefront there, helping people shield it, shielding that that community capital and that's got to be um, um, a, a central a central tenet really of um, good place making and community development so without that genuine engagement um, a process that empowers residents to reimagine and, and co-design um, communities and create that shared division then renewal regeneration it would be piecemeal um, it would be top down which we've seen far too often and it's it, it, it certainly would be as unsustainable um the vital bricks and mortar which um, um has been referred to in some cases modular housing um needs the infrastructure of roads high-speed broadband cycle lane schools transport interchanges electric charge points and um, the green public realm play areas the community hubs where people can do their do their homework and 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 and, and that vital networking um but I mean, residents are the first to ask for this but many new developments and former developments simply don't, don't have the have those vital ingredients uh, we heard much talk rightfully so of building back better and building back greener as part of the covid19 uh, recovery in place making communities have got to be at the heart of this um, of course this is the most challenging economic downturn since the war um, and in the wake of a decade of austerity where local councils have lost 60p in the pound and public services have been hollowed out um, makes the delivery of these aims even more challenging and that's why as Helen has referred to I'm sure others will do that strong partnerships between councils the housing association the volatility and the vi uh, private sector are vital to community renewal um, it must maximise that mixed economy of investment, but with people 
centre stage and regeneration not imposed upon people, imposed upon communities, but driven with residents at the heart. The role of central government has to be as an enabler, so setting up the framework with targeted public finance to let our communities and those partnerships flourish. This is unfortunately where the current government in some cases is falling down. Genuinely good affordable housing as part of the housing mix is not being built anywhere in terms of the required numbers. The latest stats from the current quarter of the market uh, ha- market housing from the Master uh, Builders Federation is 38,000 light. And if we look at social housing, um, um, last year alone, just 6,400 houses were built and even more were lost through through right to buy um, um, uh, demolition and so forth. So it's it's minus 17,000, which is, which is nowhere near good enough. So one of the obvious calls to action is to reconfigure the £12 billion affordable homes programme and create well-designed green housing, which Lord Taylor has referred to, and at scale. Um, we've now moved well beyond the clapping for uh, our key workers. So now it's time to build the houses um, for the communities that, that they deserve. This building, of course, will require a, a workforce with the right skills to build our successful communities. We've availed Housing Association. I'll do a plug for them. That's in my own constituency and many more throughout the uh, country um, have award winning employability programs. They've got the skills, they've got the abilities to deliver. Those partnerships with councils, colleges, uh, employers to get our communities working, increasing our tax take, spending the economy and sustaining tenancies, creating that genuine community wealth are vital to place making. Successful communities must also be, and I know this is something which is very close to your heart, Lord Taylor, um, well planned must be well, well, well planned. And the proposals in the current white paper seriously undermine this process and local democracy, particularly to local residents. Community engagement will be front loaded with scaled down local plans determined by a zonal framework. Tenants are still waiting for the publication of the long anticipated social housing white paper to strengthen their voice, regulations and reduce stigma against them that's got to be part of the mix now the replacement of section 106 and the community infrastructure uh, levy um, with uh, a nationally set levy will seriously erode the mix of affordable homes for the future and infrastructure as a vital mix as well there's scant details in regards to those reforms the radical extension of permitted development is a further attack on this with the government's own commissioned advisor fearing that they will create the new slum. So this liberalisation will soon be imposed on communities and towns and villages up and down the country. I would argue not building back better, not building back greener, and certainly not building beautiful if you look at the evidence. So the best best regeneration programmes will be people-led, will be inclusive long-term, which is a point I know we're emphasising today, a partnership that innovates and is flexible, well-funded with a mixed economy of funding to provide a first-class community for all. I look forward to the rest of the discussion and questions coming our way. Thank you. I'll mute myself. First rule of these events. Um, thank you very much, Mike. That, that was great. Um, Helen. Uh, Golden on this occasion. Uh, <clears throat> your take. Thank you, and thanks to Helen uh, and uh, uh, the minister there, just uh, shadow minister, just talking really about. It's always in, good to go third after people have sort of said a few things that all a lot of which I completely agree with. I have to say, and um, I just want to focus a few points, but one key point really around planning and community. So there is always obviously an inherent tension between change in a place and people wanting to, things to say the same. Um, but I think there is now a real risk that there is a more fundamental tension um, in plans to streamline consultation and planning processes alongside a desire to 
reinvent the depth and breadth of how local authorities engage with communities on local plans and big developments. I see that tension as being increasing rather than decreasing in the current years. Um, and the, I think just pinpointing on the white paper, the white paper itself talks about incredibly and extremely low levels of trust exist between local people and their faith and trust in a local authority to be able to build and develop um, a major development that actually improves that place. Seven percent trust. I mean, that may as well be no trust at all, really. Um, and I think when we look at trust, it's like, well, what builds trust? Relationships build trust. Um, and that means not just trying to cultivate trust and relationships between institutions or their housing associations or local authorities or big property developers or whoever or other anchor organizations in a place not just between organizations that have hard boundaries and with communities who are often changing contested different um uh and have their own uh, their own dynamics between them but also the trust within communities i think covid has shown us that communities can come together incredibly effectively and they can divide just as quickly, often along pre-existing fault lines that are very sort of easy to sort of rub raw the sore of discontent on, I think. And so I think that the idea of sort of how we build back better, if that's the word, or how we approach planning and development of the new homes that we need and how we have long term investment in place, which really means that people need to be able to share more than just the pavements if you're to have a strong community. Certainly where I am um, in Bethnal Green most of the time, you know, there is very few places for different people to feel a shared sense of belonging. Um, Long-term investment in a place means that your primary concern is your care about the people in that place. That means you're meeting their social and their health needs, not just the roof over their head or hell. And of course, that's massively important. It's the starting point for everything, but it's not just about that. And it's not just about a job that pays the bills. Now, what we've seen happen over the last few years for lots of different reasons has been the loss of that kind of public shared physical infrastructure, whether that's pubs or children's centres or youth centres or community centres, a whole range of things, those have just disappeared. Um, and so therefore it becomes really important not just to think about how you rebuild that, what the role of community businesses and all sorts of other kind of socially driven and community driven activities, but what's the role of new developments in making sure that we have those shared spaces with which two people can be together and have that sense of belonging and identity. Now, just to bring it to life with an example, you know, this panel is probably more well informed than I am about the history of planning and regeneration. Um, but if I look at White Hill and Borden, which is in uh, Hampshire, it's one of the healthy new towns. It's an ex MOD site. It's a brownfield site. It's got 3000 new homes. It's going to be developed over the next few years. It's got a commitment and is part of the Healthy New Towns programme. And when you go down there, although it's a really peculiar place in some ways because it's half built, half not, um, you can see that they're prioritising health, mental health and physical health as kind of core part of the design. And so there's a bit in it which has a plaza, which has some trees that will mature over time and some kind of a cluster of housing developments around it. But quite small scale, really quite friendly, convivial. And then just to the side of it, there's a, a kind of a civic space, there's a health hub and a cafe, which provides that opportunity for people to be together. Um, and when you, when you look at that and you see how people are interacting, you see how the built environment builds community. And they've been very clever, I think, at trying to also build the social community development aspect to that as well. Now, if you contrast that with a similar, take the same square footage and go down to Devon in Paynton, where you've got a small coastal town where I spent much of my teenage years, it's a place called Victoria Park Shopping Centre. You've got a similar plaza, similar concrete brick space, and there is nothing around it, nothing at all. It's just there. And when it would have been a model in the town hall for people to consult on, it will have had lots of little tiny people models sort of showing how um, lots of lovely people will be doing their shopping and sitting on benches. And what actually happens is it's desolate by day. And it's full of bored older kids at night. Now, that will be a well-known phenomenon to all of you, I'm sure. But the point to make is that the social behaviour that you see in Whitehill and Borden and the social behaviour that you see in Peyton Victoria Park Shopping Centre uh, is not an accident. It was completely designed in at the point that planning was made, that behaviour really was determined. Um, and so I think the design of those 
practice with communities and the, having the kind of the confidence and the models and the methods by which you can engage people in how you can understand what would this community like to use this space for? What do they need? What do they want? What are their aspirations for this place? And how you involve people in that process is difficult and it's messy and it's complex and it's interactive and it's social. And it's all of the things that aren't efficient and kind of, trans you know, there's, there's an awful lot of labour in those sorts of processes which aren't, uh, don't come necessarily without a good level of intent and a good level of kind of commitment. And so I guess the fundamental point I really wanted to make was that long term investment in a place that's going to thrive is really about how you make community development, not community engagement, community development, the same discipline as property development. How do you think of those things? It's absolutely fundamentally two sides of the same coin. And there we have it. Um, thank you, Helen. I agree uh, with a huge amount of what you said I, I know Whitehill Borden very well. Uh, I, I use this as an example of um, uh, of a number of things, uh, but but particularly what I talk about is the governance of delivery. So how how you create curate the creation of place and community as apart from building houses, which is a very different thing and can lead to well exactly the kind of outcomes that you just uh, uh, described by comparison. But uh, we'll come back to all of that because. Uh, we haven't quite finished. We have we we have no sign of Ben. Uh, so, uh, Will, your your opportunity is here. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Taylor, and um, thank you for having me. I will do my very best to uh, do the impression of a uh, Tees Valley uh, mayor, um, albeit without the accent uh, or the uh, in-depth knowledge of his place. No, I will. Um, I wanted to just. Um, say three points really to, to largely reiterating some of the things that other people have said but perhaps developing them slightly um uh and so the, the first one is um stems from a piece of work that onward has just published uh, about a week ago called the state of our social fabric which looked at the state of community uh, in britain today and how that change has changed over time and how it differs in different geographies um and as part of that work we went to a number of different parts of the country. We talked to local people and tried to get a handle on what community means today. Um, and one of the abiding themes from that qualitative work um, was that uh, was that local people, to a far greater extent than I think than policymakers often acknowledge, um, really care about the importance of, uh, or, or think that there is a very strong importance, a tribute to strong importance to social housing in their place. So when we talked to people in Glasgow, people spoke um, uh, actually not romantically, but incredibly, incredibly profoundly about the importance of uh, Glasgow, Glasgow tenement buildings and and the uh, the support that that growing up in those type of uh, buildings, that kind of shared space and the um, the mutual aid and, and human kindness that came from uh, living in a, in a kind of social housing community, um, uh, what that meant to them. Um, I myself, um, until very late last year, I think Helen knows this, um, was living uh, just around the corner from the Boundary Estate in Shoreditch, um, uh, where I lived for uh, about 10 years, um, uh, which I think still claims that it is the first ever social housing estate in uh, in Europe. Um, that is not just a beautiful, um, a beautiful part of London, but also somewhere where um, a large number of uh, flats are still social housing, and there are um, still large numbers of people who uh, speak very movingly about the the, the kind of support and um, uh, sense of community and belonging that comes from living in uh, in that social. Um, uh, kind of housing setting. Um, and uh, so I think the, f the first point that I really wanted to make was that we shouldn't underestimate, underestimate the importance and the role of social housing in the social fabric of communities. And I think too often um, we treat social housing merely as a, as a means to development rather than a means to, as Helen said, community development and community um, uh, kind of strengthening. Um, and just to put some data on that, um, when you look at the government's understanding society survey and the breakdown by tenure, um, 
we found recently that uh, when you ask people about the extent to which they belong to their neighbourhood, how, how much do you feel like you belong to your neighbourhood? 56% of people in social housing say they belong to their neighbourhood, either strongly or, or a fair amount. 66% of homeowners say that they do, but only 40%, 47% of private renters do. So there's a big um, gap between uh, private renters and social housing and uh, and homeowners, um, uh, and double the amount of private renters compared to social housing tenants say they do not belong in the neighbourhood. So there is a um, there is uh, I think something quite innate and important about the link between social housing and, and belonging, and clearly um, the feelings of belonging, the importance of place, that kind of oikophilia that Morris Glassman was talking about at the conference yesterday. That is clearly an increasingly important part of our. Uh, of our politics and, and our society. Um, we have obviously seen the long-term decline of social housing over many years, but more than that, I think we've seen the decline of stable housing. If you look at the data between kind of the 19, uh, 19, mid-1990s, 1993, and today, um, the proportion of people in either home ownership or social uh, rent has declined from around about nine in 10 people um, to uh, just over three in four people, 78%. Um, and that's been driven not just by the declines in home ownership we've seen since 2003, but also by a long term decline in social rent. Uh, since the Second World War, the average rate of construction for social housing has fallen by about 95% on our, um, uh, on our figures. Um, and uh, that undoubtedly is having quite a big effect on um, not just the number of people in secure, stable tenancies uh, or tenures, but um, but also the number of young people, particularly in um, stable and secure tenures. So I think there is a there is a key generational um, question here, um, and so for those reasons, um, I'm very very supportive of the role that social housing can play in communities. But I just want to urge one note of caution, um, which comes from a Labour commissioned report actually uh, just over 10 years ago, the Hills Review, which looked at the link between social housing and employment and um, found uh, a number of links between um, social housing tenure and lower rates of employment um, that couldn't be accounted for by uh, by the underlying characteristics of those groups. Subsequent reviews have, have um, largely shown the same thing. Um, so, for example, between 1981 and 2006, the full-time employment rate for social housing tenants fell um, from 67% to just 34% amongst work, working age social tenants, according to the Hills Review. Um, and uh, if you look at outflows from employment, um, while there was a very marginal 1.7%, uh, outflow from people who are in employment in 1994, 10 years later, um, uh, 4.1%, so nearly just over double um, the number of social tenants um, were uh, were um, falling out of employment uh, in, in that time. So th- it feels to me that there is a challenge to those who want to significantly grow the social housing sector. Um, uh, as I as I kind of would endorse implicitly, is that the, we we need to think about, as Helen alluded to, the wider role of social of, of housing associations and social housing, and the um, the, the social purpose in terms of employment support, in terms of um, uh, kind of other forms of support for those in those tenancies. Um, and I think there are some really interesting opportunities then. So um, the Kickstart programme, for example, that the government's just launched, I know that housing associations are clubbing together to put together a consortium to provide Kickstart placements, six month placements for young people. That seems to me to be a perfect opportunity for the housing association sector to, to come together and um, demonstrate uh, its uh, commitment to supporting not just new housing development, but also the development of community, the supply of strong, secure jobs in um, different communities up and down the land. So um, so uh, just to kind of wrap up, I, I'm very supportive of the role of social housing. I think it plays a fundamental role in local communities up and down this country. But um, we should be cautious and, and recognise where there are areas where it could um, augment or improve its role over time, especially around employment. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Will, for that. Um, I, 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 I'm, I've been seeing lots of questions um, uh, coming past. And one of the themes that came out from all, all of the speakers, I think, and uh, has been picked up by people like Andrew Taylor and Ian Harvey in questions is 
and, and indeed actually Charles Campion and uh, uh, Mel Hillbrow is is the issue of community engagement in in design of place. Um, I often say that uh, the, sch- the schemes go wrong when um, a developer is planning to build as many houses as they can fit on the site as possible, actually encouraged by often by the council that's saying, well, we need houses. Um, and they know the scheme won't go very well. So, so, so it's presented in a hotel room in the back of beyond by a couple of guys in suits who hope no one will turn up because they know that they'll get criticized. And, uh, the engagements I like, um, and I work with people like um, Ben Bulger from the Prentice Foundation, Quarry by Design, uh, Charles Campion, who I just mentioned, who who who'll, who'll run charades, uh, uh One kind of steps in front of people and offers them the opportunity to co-design, uh, genuinely involving them in the design of place. And I've taken very big schemes that started as controversial to the point that they've had little or no opposition at the end by building people in and actually have delivered faster as a result. And a number of the comments have, have, have reflected that. So we, you've all talked about community. I just wondered if what your thoughts were about, uh, it's easy to say, but how do we make that, that community engagement real? How do we change the mindset, if you like, to, to the co-creation of place? Because I think, I think you're all saying that's, that community involvement is critical, but we're not, clearly most development isn't doing it. Yes. Do you want me to come? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, co- co- co-design um, communities require um, support, training, some education. I, I, I think um, Tony Harvey has re- re- referred to this, and and certainly there are plenty of people in the field and uh, housing associations and other stakeholders are well versed in this. I mean, internationally, I know it's been trialled in some parts of, uh, of of the UK as well. It's you know, uh, um, participatory budgeting as well. There's a former councillor in Fallowfield. That's something that we did try. So it's an education process between priorities. Um, um, you're right, rather than stuck in, uh, sticking people in a room with uh, uh, various slides around just a, a limited choice and, you know, um, placemaking regeneration done to people, it, it, it's essential to do drive things forward and actually um, um, prioritise. But that vision, has got to be owned by the community. And it'll evolve over time, disappoint some people, but you're, you're right, um, um, Lord Taylor, you bring bring people on that journey with you, really, and so they own it. Any other thoughts, Helen? Let's just offer a couple of examples, really, um, and I agree with that completely. Um, and often co-production and co-design and those words are kind of more often es- espoused than they are enacted. Um, is difficult um, and it's easy not to do um, it's too easy not to do actually um, without because you have that kind of uh, disassociation from what the long-term impacts of not doing it are and of course years later we discover that we should have done it but we've been working on a, a fairly major development in southeast London and the approach there has been is not actually co-designed because actually those plans were were made um, was to how do you hold the developer to account for, develop, for ensuring that the process of design and development actually benefits and creates a community. So we um, worked with the developer and the local council to employ and train a whole load of community researchers. Now, those people are just ordinary people. They live in the place. Um, they've probably lived there for a long time, so they're not the people that are going to occupy the new homes. They're the indigenous community who are having the years of upfront impact before they realise of that in development. And they were trained to go off into the spaces and places where professional researchers or professionals just can't get into. Talking about uh, what they think a good community is, what they think a good place around here is, what, what are the components and characteristics and dynamics that you have if we want to be happy. Collected all that together, um, we sort of did some co-design work with those community researchers and the local community groups, and up producing a, co- a kind of social value framework to handle to the developers say this is what a good this is what your indigenous community think is a good community and they've turned that into their social value framework to hold to be held account to over the long term now i love that idea i've seen it i think it's gone very well the truth is in the pudding like how how much and how integral that feels to the developer will will uh, will and the council will change over time i'm sure but there are ways of, of bringing in communities when we worked with 
in Halstead in Essex, who again were people who were experiencing the impact of new development, but not necessarily the ones who were going to take advantage of it. We tried to think about, well, how do you how do you think about not who are these strangers coming into our place, but how do you welcome those strangers? And that sounds quite trite, um, but that mindset shift of these are, how would you want to be a welcoming community resulted in one of the groups developing a little community magazine that now gets put in the door of every new person moves into the neighbourhood, which says, this is where your communities are, this is where your is. You know, these things sound really soft and little, but they make a big difference to how much agency the existing people feel and how involved and how belong the newcomers feel. So a couple of examples there, small. Um, I'm going to sort of be a, a little bit challenging for all of you, I, I suspect, because um, uh, there's been some concerns expressed about the white paper. But one of the things I talk to councils a lot is that if they simply allocate land in the local plan, what will then happen is the land is traded. And because of the value that's spent on it, ultimately, the, the, the lovely things described in the local plan actually won't happen because it becomes because it's unviable because of the price that the land's been traded at and uh matthew i couldn't read uh, another matthew i couldn't read all the same uh was, was making the point in, was in bristol uh, developers have bought the land and need a certain density because of the price that they paid for it and i often say to councils who are looking to do big allocations of, of new supplements urban extensions that it's critical that they put into the local plan policy criteria that say you will have mixed use, you will be mixed tenure, you will develop these certain attributes and not rely on a design code that comes later, which is appealable against viability. And one of the things that actually I I quite like about the white paper is it describes putting in place those requirements at the local plan stage in consultation uh, with the community. So it reflects that advice. And I know that all sorts of worries, and I understand those, but... uh, I think that there's a, uh, I'd be interested in, in views here about the stage at which you can lock in and how you lock in the promises that are made, the quality that is made. Because one thing's for sure, I've seen many, many schemes where at, at the proposal stage, they, they, they've been described in wonderful terms and then they've not been delivered at anything like the qualities that, 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 that the community thought they were going to get. Um, Helen, Helen um, uh, what's your housing association experience? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like about housing is, it, to a certain degree, I always feel that if the housing association is involved in the placemaking, what's promised will be more what you get. But equally, you are often the recipient of housing within within private sector schemes that may not be all you desire. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a fundamental tension between the way that the uh, social housing is financed, the requirement for speed of delivery, the structure of cross-subsidy from sale, and the, you know, desperate need to be addressed and and the sort of time that is needed for fundamental place making programs, the time that is needed to create capacity in the community to, uh, you know, successfully and positively influence how developments look and work. And where I think this has worked much, you know, the best examples for housing associations tend to be long term regeneration schemes where the various sort of infrastructure issues, having to rehouse people, having to relocate people, having to negotiate with owner occupiers and so on, puts a limit on the speed with which the scheme can be delivered and therefore allows time for those kind of activities to take place. But there is a fundamental tension between the, you know, we need 300,000 homes a year and the kind of input that is needed to produce really successful uh, you know, scale play, places at scale. And we need to have an open discussion about that because our financial model is in a way is driving some of these density, intense development, fast developments that are needed to, you know, to meet demand, um, but have the long term problems that we're all aware of. I have to say, given coronavirus, you know, somebody who's argued for more garden communities and, 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 and more mixed use and 
frankly, less density and less reliance on towers. Um, I, I suspect coronavirus has rather changed the, uh, the, the debate on this. So it's, uh, we, we've, we're running out of time, rather shockingly, yeah. but, uh, so we can't go into it. But, but I do think that's true. Mike, can I just give you the last word? I, I, I kind of challenge the assumption, you know, it's easy to say the government's all wrong. Is there stuff in the white paper that you would say, actually, this bit, you know, lots I disagree with, but, but, but something you'd like to pick up from it or, or something you'd like to put in it as a single item? Just at your last word, we've only got a few seconds. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you mentioned the, the the land question there. At the moment, it's uh, it's very front loaded. Is that um, community engagement according to the to, to the plans there? So that's the way it do, demeans democracy and actually favours um, um, commercial developers with with, with deep, deeper pockets. So that certainly need to look at that. And um, look, I'm, I'm I'm with you, everyone, on this call. Look, I'd like to see a greater mix in terms of how how is it um, and public land for 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 public good. With we've actually you know uh, healthy healthy homes and healthy housing. If you look at the current pan- pandemic, built into the built into the to, into the plans. So the amendments to be laid. You know, I'd be kind of looking at that and the key campaigners um, um, certainly uh, marching forward. Um, um, with, with with that in their hearts at the moment, um, I, 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 I'm being told I've got to stop you there, but it's a good, it's a nice thought to stop on. So, and and thank you very much. I I I think we could have all enjoyed talking further. I hope those uh, listening have enjoyed this as well. We've had uh, lots of comments. I've picked up a few of the questions, uh, but I, I think one thing's for sure: there's a uh, there's, there's a huge interest being expressed by those commenting on, on community engagement and building communities with people. Uh, and and I, think, I think that's something we would all welcome. So thank you very much indeed. Lord Taylor, you can leave through the, the red door on the left. As it still said live, I wasn't sure if I was still yeah. live. So. <laughs> and you hit the red door. All right. Thank you.